All right, we ready to get started? How are you guys today? Good. I feel a little ill-prepared for class today. Uh, usually I spend a little bit of time reviewing and kind of thinking about what I'm going to talk about, but to be honest, I've spent like the last, I'm not sure how many free hours just trying to make sure that we were going to get working video this time. Hopefully it will actually work out. Um, could I answer any questions for either of you before we dig in? Okay. When we left off, we had been talking about routing in Rails, and that had then led to a discussion about uh, REST, uh, representational state transfer, uh, REST. We had gotten most of the way through talking about REST, basically saying that essentially what REST is, is it's a standard that people can follow, developers can follow, that will more easily enable communications between various applications. So essentially REST revolves around the idea that requests for data, requests to manipulate data, requests to do anything with data are basically put into the form of uh, URLs. Right? Those URLs are then sent to an application where if that application understands the REST standard, we'll be able to understand and interpret that URL and uh, know what it is that that URL is supposed to represent, what action that URL is supposed to trigger. Right? The actual response from the application then can take the form of HTML, XML, JSON, whatever, essentially, which is what the respond to block back over in our controllers basically made fairly easy for us to do. Right? Now, in REST, there are considered to be essentially seven core actions. Index, show, new, edit, create, update, and destroy which hopefully sound familiar because those are also the core seven methods that we tend to find in most all Rails controllers. And the reason for that is that Rails is basically RESTful down to its core. It's kind of been built since version two to revolve around this idea of being RESTful. As a matter of fact, you could pretty much take any Rails application and you could kind of think of it as being two parts. One part is the model and controller, which you can think of as sort of like being the back end of the system that responds to RESTful requests. And then you've got the front end, which is essentially sort of the views, which sends those RESTful requests in the form of the hyperlinks that we put into those views, and then returns either a new view or different pieces of data, depending on exactly how we have the application set up. Right? So really, working with REST, the central idea, the thing you have to understand about it is basically these seven request type URLs, the seven different URLs we have. So I just wanted to kind of lay those out for you real quick. We know that there are these seven essential actions. So we've got index, show, new, edit, create, update, and destroy. Right? Each one of those will have a particular URL pattern that will go along with it. Right. So let me throw some of those in here. Let's say that we were working just generically with something called an item. Right. The URL we would use to request a list of items, which would correspond to the index action in a controller, would just be slash items, plural. The URL for requesting information about a specific item, like what would correspond to the show action in most of our controllers, would be slash item singular, and then slash and some ID number to identify which item it is that we're actually wanting to see information about. The new action, whenever we want to request that a new item be created, the URL would be slash item slash new, that would go typically to the new action in our controller. With edit, we would do slash item. Actually, that should be items, sorry, on all those. Okay. Slash item, slash the ID, and then slash edit would be the pattern for the URL we would typically see for editing something that was RESTful. To create something, we would do slash items slash in the ID number. <coughs> no, I'm sorry, for create, it's just slash items. 
no ID number yet when we're creating something. When we update something, it would be slash items slash and an ID number. And when we destroy something, it would be slash items slash and an ID number. So that's basically what the different URL patterns in a RESTful application would look like. And each one of those would then call one of those particular actions. You with me so far? All right. Do you see that there's a bit of a problem there? Index and create have the exact same URL. Show, update, and destroy all have the exact same URL. So if a RESTful application receives the URL slash items, how does the application know if it's supposed to provide a list of all the items or if it's supposed to create a new item? If the application receives a URL like slash items slash ID number, how does it know if it's supposed to show that item, update that item, or destroy that item? Well, the key to all of that is the actual HTTP method that's used to send the request. Requests can be sent as get requests, post requests, right, which are the two most common. Right? You run into those all the time in PHP, in HTML. Right? Besides those two, though, Rails also makes use of a type of request called a put and a type of request called a delete. Right? Now, you might remember get and post. Basically, with a get request, really all there is is a URL which is why when information is sent as a GET request, it's right there as a URL parameter at the end of the URL itself, because that's essentially all there is, is the URL. With a POST request, on the other hand, you don't see the data in the URL, because when a POST request is sent, there's other information besides the URL itself. There's the actual request body, which can contain the information from a submitted form, for example. So then Rails also has these other two that it makes use of, put and delete. Right? A put request is a lot like a um, post request, where additional data can be carried in the actual request body. A delete request is a lot like a get request, where there's really only a URL, so any information that's uh, sent is basically encoded as part of the URL itself. Right? So, the way this would work out then is that Rails will be able to use the actual type of HTTP method, the actual type of the request, along with the URL to determine exactly what it is, what, what's being requested to happen. Like for the problem where index and create use the same URL pattern, that's okay because they don't use the same request type. Right? If the request is a get request and the URL is slash items, then the application would know that we're requesting the index, the list of all the items. With create, on the other hand, instead of it being a get request, it would be a post request. Right? So again, if it's that same URL slash items, but a post request instead, the application would understand that we're not requesting a list of items, we're requesting that a new item be created. Okay. New requests are always sent as gets. Okay. Edit requests are always sent as get. Right. For the other three, show, update, and destroy, where the URL pattern is always the same, slash items, slash ID, okay. each one of them uses a different request type. So show will be sent as a get request, okay. update will be sent as a put, and destroy will be sent as a delete. Right. So the combination of the URL and the actual method that's used to send the request, those two things together can unambiguously describe any one of those seven core actions. Right. Should work that way with any RESTful application, any application that follows this RESTful standard, which basically means all Rails applications, right? all modern Rails applications anyway. Right? <clears throat> so it's something that we use internally in our own application itself, 
Like for example, when we've been putting together our CRUDs, when we put together our delete link, we always have to specify that it's a delete method that's used. If we don't use the delete method, you might have noticed that what happens is when you click on the delete link, it ends up taking you to the show page instead. The reason for that is, of course, that the URL for delete and show are the same. With a hyperlink, if you don't specify to make it a delete type link, then it automatically defaults to get, so the show page is what you end up getting. So really understanding these is pretty core, pretty crucial to everything that goes on with Rails routes. So in the last class we had talked about putting together routes. Thankfully, if we want our application to be RESTful, we don't have to go through and by hand put together routes to go along with all of these. We certainly could. Right? We could do things like, say, match slash items with the items controller index action via get. And we could do match slash items slash ID via get matches up with uh, the show action of the items controller. We could go through and write all those out by hand using match methods if we want to. Okay? But you might remember back in our gadgets example, which is actually the, the, the code that I have up right here, if I go back to my config directory and look at my routes file, what I had you all do back when we were working on this was in our routes file, we simply put in resources, called a resources method, for our gadget types and our gadgets. Okay? What that resources method does for us when we put it in the routes file is it basically automatically creates all of the RESTful routes that are needed for that particular entity. So when I say resources for gadget types, the resources method will automatically create all of the necessary RESTful routes for gadget types. Right? When I say resources gadgets, it creates all of, the res all of the RESTful routes that are necessary for the gadgets. Right? Really, that's all I have here in this file. It's just those two lines. If I jump out to the terminal and I run a rake routes, we can see what those two statements, those two resources method calls actually do for us. It ends up creating all of these different routes. And if you kind of look through them, you'll see that these follow that exact same restful pattern that we were just talking about. Like look at those there that are highlighted for gadget types. If it's a get request, and the URL is slash gadget types, it goes to the index. If it's a post request for slash gadget types, it goes to the create. If it's a get request for gadget types new, it goes to new. If it's a get request for gadget type ID slash edit, it goes to edit. If it's a get request for gadget type ID, it goes to show. Same URL but a put goes to update. Same URL but a delete goes to destroy. Right? So exactly those same RESTful route patterns that we were just talking about, we get those done for us automatically simply in our routes file by saying I need the resources for this particular entity. That puts together those routes for us without us having to do anything else special. What do you think? Not too bad? What questions can I answer for you about routes? About anything at all? Meaning of life? Boba Fett shoe size? Six, strangely enough. He has unusually small feet for a bounty hunter. I'm just kidding, I have no idea. Okay. There's a couple of different topics that we have kind of talked a little bit about, maybe even in some cases brushed over a little bit. And what I thought we might do next is go back and put together a bit more of an example, see if we can't find some more practical ways to actually implement a few of the things we've talked about. One of the things that I want to play with that we've never actually used but just discussed briefly is sessions in Rails. Okay. Way back when, when we talked about uh, flash messages for the first time, I mentioned to you that Rails also has the ability to work with sessions. Hopefully you remember from something like PHP what sessions are. 
the basic idea with a session is it's server side per user storage. Okay? The basic idea with a session is that whenever a session is created for a user, a cookie gets put on that user's computer in that user's browser, and that cookie has in it some kind of weird random ID that hopefully is difficult to impersonate or fake in any way. Right? Rails then remembers what weird random ID it gave to a particular user and it, ma and it stores that on the server side and matches that up with a little bit of storage. So essentially it lets us say for whatever users accessing this page right now store this information. Right? Then the next time that user does something, the next time they access another page, the next time they make another request, Rails will again see the value of that cookie and be able to access whatever data had been stored for that user previously. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. As a matter of fact, if we go over to a browser, if I go and I take a look at my cookies, where do they hide them in here nowadays? Mm -hmm. Usernames and passwords. I probably shouldn't show that to you. Where am I missing it? Do you see something in here for cookies that I overlooked? Oh, there it is. Cookies and other website data. Let me look at the details. Okay. Cookies for localhost. Not going to let me actually look at them. All right. Let's try looking at them a different way. Let me pull up my inspector here. Somewhere down here, let us peek at our cookies, won't they? Cookies. There we go. <laughs> I don't see any particular cookie in there for Rails at the moment. Unless it's one of these UTMA, UTMZ ones. Hard to tell for sure. Okay. But it's quite possible that we may see a cookie pop up there in here somewhere in addition to these. Right? Which would basically be the cookie that's being given to my computer by our little Rails application so that the Rails application would then know that it's me making a particular request so it could then make whatever little bit of storage, whatever little bit of data has been stored for me available on subsequent requests. Okay? So anyway, we talked a little bit about sessions but we've never actually used them so I wanted to do an example where we can use them. Okay? We also talked about filters but didn't do a whole lot with them. Want to throw some filter stuff in and we now have talked about routes. So whatever we're going to do, do a little bit of route stuff in it as well. Right? So what I was thinking we might do in order to demonstrate all these things is to go back to our gadget example and set it up so that it has authentication in it. So essentially what the idea would be, sort of from a user's point of view, is that the user can't access any gadget information unless they log in. User can't log in unless they have a user account. Kind of what you generally expect, right? Alright. Uh, once the user does log in, they'd be able to create gadgets but not types. Right? And the gadgets that the user stores would be their gadgets. Whenever they logged in, they would see their own gadgets but nobody else's. So if user A logged in and created three gadgets, user B logged in and created five, user A would only see their three when they logged in after that in the future, and user B would only see their five. They wouldn't see each other's gadgets. Everybody would have their own little private collection of gadgets. Right? And of course, if the user can log in, we also want to make sure that we also give them the ability to log out. So that's kind of the direction we need to go. Make sense so far? Okay, good, good, good. Um, how are we actually going to manage all this? Well, what we're going to need is we're going to need users. Go figure, right? Who would have guessed users would be necessary? But yeah, we're going to have to create users. We're going to have to have a table in the database where we store information about user accounts. That way we can store usernames and passwords so that we can tell if somebody is logging in correctly or not. Yeah. When we actually store user information in the database, we do not want to store their password using plain text. If their password is password, we don't want the word password in our database. Instead, we want to hash, right? We want to confuse the actual appearance of the password itself 
So if our database was ever stolen, the user's passwords would not be just completely out in the open in plain text. Right? Can't guarantee perfect safety for the user's password if our database was violated, but we can do better than storing it in plain text. All right. So we're going to need users. We're going to have to have a relationship between users and gadgets. One to many relationship, one user has many gadgets, was basically what I described before. Does that sound right? Okay. So we'll have to put that together. Of course, we'll have the full setup we'll have to do for users too. We're going to need a user model, going to need a user's controller, we're going to need view pages for creating users, deleting users, editing users, all of that sort of thing. All right, so that's all going to have to be done. Once all that's basically there, we're also then going to have to somehow be able to manage the concept of being logged in. That's where the sessions come in. Essentially, what we'll want to do is that whenever a user completes our login process, we'll have to create a login page somewhere. What we'll want to do is we'll want to take that user's user ID and store it in their session. That way, when they log in on the login page, when they then go to all the subsequent pages, we'll be able to remember, hey, this user has already logged in. So whenever somebody successfully completes the login process, their ID number will go into their session we can then look for it on the all following requests and be able to tell whether they've completed the login or not. Anytime we have a user try to access a page that they're not supposed to access who doesn't have their ID in their session, they get bounced over to the login page. Tell them you got to log in first. Okay. We're also then going to need somewhere to actually be able to store all this code for managing these IDs in the session. Right? So what I would say we do for that is we create a sessions controller. The sessions controller could be the place where we sort of centralize what we need to be able to do to log a user in and log a user out again. Right? Instead of mixing that in with the rest of the user's basic actions, we can split that off right? and make a sessions controller that will handle all that for us. Okay. So does this all sound doable? It's not. It's completely impossible. It cannot be done. Ah, well, well. We'll give it a try anyway, though. Who knows, maybe we'll get lucky. All right, well, let's start with the bare necessities. We need a user class, don't we? Okay. If we're going to create a user class, like I said before, that means we're going to need to create a user model. We're going to need to write the user controller with the seven basic actions in it. We're going to need to create the four basic view pages for a user, index, show, uh, new, and edit. Right? Bit of work ahead of us. Or there is a shortcut we could take. Right? Normally when we create something new we use a Rails generator. Like we'll say Rails generate model user and then we'll go on and tell it information about what we want to create. Well there's another generator that we haven't played with before called a scaffold generator. So if I say Rails generate scaffold I tell it I want to create a scaffold for a user. I'm going to tell it that every user has a username. And I'm going to tell it that every user has a password digest. Both of them are strings, so I don't need to specify the data type. If I run that, What did the scaffold generator do for me? Well, it created for me the user model. It created for me the user controller with all of the methods already filled in and complete. Look familiar? Under Views, Users, it created for me the index page with a table showing all the information about users. Created the Show page. Created the New and the Edit pages. And created the Form, including displaying the errors up at the top, all of which hopefully look familiar.
Seem okay? Do you catch what just happened? All the code that we've been learning to write for the last two, three, maybe four weeks, turns out there's a generator in Rails that'll write all that for you. I just, I guess it slipped my mind. I forgot to mention it to you. I very specifically tried to avoid ever mentioning the scaffold generator until now. Because what the scaffold generator really is, is it's a terrible crutch, right? It's really easy to get started in Rails using the scaffold generator and not have any idea how anything actually works, right? You end up basically just generating scaffold for everything and then sitting there and hacking away at it, not understanding how all the different parts actually work together. Which is why I was mean, did the old math teacher trick, and went through and showed you the hard manual way to do everything before I showed you the real super quick easy way. Because what my hope was, was that now that you've gone through and had to write everything that the scaffold generator does for you automatically by hand, right? hopefully you already understand how all these different parts fit together, what all these different parts do. Right? So at that point, the scaffold generator just becomes a time saver. Right? It's not a mystery box that just spits out this unintelligible code that you don't understand at all. Right? I, it's what I hope anyway. Who knows if I actually made it, if I actually helped anything. Okay? The scaffold generator sometimes can be great when you just need a basic CRUD setup. That's exactly what it gives you, the very most basic CRUD setup. Does it do everything for you that you might possibly want to have done? No, absolutely not. Very rarely under any circumstances do you not still have to go back and edit or change some of what the scaffold generator has done. Okay? Like, for example, on the index page it created for me for my users, it's going to show the encoded password there. I don't want to see the encoded password for a user. It's going to be this big, giant, page-wide, long, unintelligible string of random characters. I have no desire to see that. Right? <clears throat> so I'm going to end up wanting to take that out. Okay. There are going to be some other bits and pieces in here, like the fact that it created a show page for me for the user. I don't care to be able to see a user. From my point of view, all a user really is is a username. So I'm going to wipe out the show page or the link to the show page. I could get rid of the show page itself if I wanted to. Okay. There are also going to be a whole lot of cases where the scaffold generator doesn't help at all. Like when I was telling you before that we'll probably want to create a sessions controller to handle the logging in and logging out. Well, the sessions controller isn't even going to have a model associated with it. The sessions controller is just going to be there for putting data in and taking data out of the session hash. Right? So the scaffold generator is not going to help me at all when it comes to working with sessions. Right? The session controller will be completely non-traditional, which is not at all uncommon. So the scaffold generator is not going to help me a lick when it comes to that. Right? So anyway, it's there. Use it for what it's worth. Okay. Let's see how things are going. Oh, if I go back over to my command prompt, I still need to do rake db migrate to catch my database up with the fact that there's now a users table there. There's also some things I need to do over in the user model. Over in the user model, I'm going to call a method there called has secure password. This is a nice little convenient method that was added, I believe in Rails 3, if I remember correctly. Basically, what has secure password will do for us is it will automatically set it up so that we can give a password for a user and it will automatically handle the encryption of it and storage into the proper field, which is why I needed to create that field called password digest. Right? I'm not actually going to ask the user to create a password digest. I'm going to ask the user to create a password. 
but with this has secure password method called inside the user class. Whenever the user is given a password, it'll automatically encrypt it and store it as what they call a password digest. The other thing that has secure password will do for me is it will automatically add to my user model an authenticate method. So that essentially I can take a password and give it to this authenticate method and what will happen is the class will automatically take that password I give it, will perform the same encryption, the same hashing on that new password, and then will tell me true or false whether the password that was just given matches the password that's stored for that user. Back on lab, what was it, lab two maybe, when you all were working with models and you wrote a user model, you wrote an authenticate method yourself, some password methods yourself, this has secure password method basically does that for us automatically. So that's nice. Okay. While I'm here in my user model, let me also go ahead, and go ahead and add a couple of validations. I'm going to say for my user model, let's validate username for presence, true, and for uniqueness, true. I think we can do both of those there. We'll find out shortly. And for the password, I'm going to validate the presence as being true, right? but I only want to do that on create, only when the user is created. If the user is edited, I don't want to look for something called password because the user itself doesn't actually have anything called password. Password is just sort of a front door to the encryption that occurs to then get the password digest. So it's only when we're creating a new user. I don't know, I'm feeling pretty shaky about putting those two together. Let me split those up. There we go. I'll do the presence and the uniqueness for username separately. Maybe it would have worked together, but I don't want to come back and mess with it when we're neck deep in something else. If it turns out it doesn't work. Okay, so I think that basically gives us the model we need. Can't off the top of my head think that there's anything in particular in the, in the controller that we need. The controller that was set up for us by the scaffold generator, generated scaffold, is pretty much what we would have written by hand. The index gets a list of all users. Right? We would have usually left it at that because we're lazy humans. But the scaffold generator went ahead and also then put in a respond block, respond to block. So it responds to HTML by rendering our index page. Or if the request asks for the data in JSON format, it'll go ahead and give that to it. Okay. Show is again basically what we would have written, but also has the respond to block in there. So we can get the response in HTML or JSON format. Okay. The new is the same story. Right. Edit, right? no JSON response for an edit page, so it's just the basic edit page we get for that one. Our create method looks a little bit more complicated than what we've written by hand, but it's really the same thing. Right? We take the submitted user data from the params hash, we create a new user out of it, and then what makes create look a little bit more complicated than what we've done is they've taken the entire next section and wrapped it inside this big respond to block. Essentially though what we're doing is we're trying to save the user. If they save successfully, then if it's an HTML response we redirect over to the show page. In this case I don't think that's really what I want to do but maybe we'll come back and fix that here in a bit. If the user saves successfully and the request type was JSON, then what we end up doing is rendering back that user's data as JSON data, along with a status message saying that yes, that user was created, and a URL of where that user's information can be found. If saving the user here in the create method fails, right, then just like we would have normally done, if the request is HTML type, then we just re-render the new page. If the request, though, was of JSON type, then we actually render the errors themselves as JSON data along with a status 
that it's an unprocessable entity, something that we can't save. So a little more complicated, but the core of what's there is just like exactly what we've been doing by hand. Same basic idea down with update. Really not much different there. Okay. Down with destroy, it's back to that very simple pattern. Right? We would normally do retrieve the user, destroy the user, and then redirect back to the index page. Same thing happens here, except it also has, handles the potential that if the request was made in JSON, it just returns nothing. So, for the moment anyway, I think our user's controller looks pretty okay. The index action, or the index view, I should say, for my users, I just modified it a little bit ago so that it's basically just displaying the uh, username, okay, an edit and a destroy link. The show page, I'm not even going to worry about right now. The new and the edit page are just what they are. They, of course, both use the form partial right here. The form partial it put together has a text field where we can put in the name for the new user and a text field where we can put in the password digest. Now, that I don't want. Right? The password digest is the confirmation or the uh, encryption ver encrypted version of the password and I don't want the user to type in their own encrypted password. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to change this and say that's just a field called password which should then automatically be understood by the user model and the has secure password method that we called so that it will take that thing I submitted called password and will turn it into the password digest, essentially. I also, though, in here want to add another field called password confirmation. That's something else that that has secure password method is going to look for, is that we submitted the same password as both the password and its confirmation, just so it knows that there's less of a chance that we've made some sort of mistake when typing it. We good? Right. If I jump over to my browser and I go to slash users, uh-oh. I get an error. It comes back and tells me that bcrypt hyphen Ruby is not a part of the bundle. Add it to my gem file. Uh, bcrypt Ruby is an encryption library for Ruby, and that's what that has secure password method uses. So apparently it uses it, but it didn't actually put it into the gem file. Let me go over and take a look at my gem file. It should be up on the top level of your project folder. Look at that. It's in there as a comment. If you want to use has secure password, uncomment this line. So I'm going to uncomment that line. I'm going to go back out to the terminal and I'm going to run bundle. That should go in and make sure that bcrypt Ruby is installed. There it is right there. Installed and available to the application. If I go back to my browser and refresh again, <clears throat> getting another error, undefined method key for nil class. Wonder where that's coming from. No idea. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go shut down my server. Then I'm going to start it up again. Back to the browser, refresh. Oop, the error went away. 
That happens sometimes. There's no rule that says specifically you can't update your gem file while the web server is running. A lot of times you update the gem file while the web server is running and everything goes just fine. But every once in a while, right, like just then, I try to keep it in mind that if I make a change to the gem file and the next thing that happens is I start seeing strange errors that I have no idea where they're coming from, right, give the web server a restart before you start ripping into, any, into anything. A lot of times that's all it is, is you just need a... The, the web server to basically reload the application and be able to recognize the new uh, new library, the new gem that's been installed. All right, so my index page, I'm going to click on new user. My new user, I'm going to create a new user called test1. I'll give them a password and a password confirmation, test and test. I should probably turn those into password fields, right? I guess it depends on who's using it. I'll hit create user. It says it can't mass assign protected attributes, password, and password confirmation. What's that about? You all know that one by now? Right here? The adder accessible line in the user model is saying that only the password digest and the username are accessible attributes. In actuality, what I want is for username, password, and password confirmation to be accessible attributes, basically things that can be set from a form. Back in the browser, I hit refresh now. It seems pretty happy. It took me to the show page for my new user. You can see the username I typed in, and it's actually showing the value for the password digest. What's the error? Uh, password doesn't match confirmation. Password can't be blank. They're not blank. They're both not. Hmm. Um, in your form, double check the typing in the names of those fields. Better yet? Good. Okay. Is there any way I could take that password digest and turn it back into the user's original password to display it? Hopefully the answer is no. That's the whole idea behind that password digest is it should have been put through a mathematical formula essentially that makes sure that anytime that password goes through the formula this is always the answer but also at the same time make sure that it can't be reversed. There shouldn't be any way that I could take this output, put it back through the formula backwards and get the password again, which is essentially why it's better to have something like this, a password digest stored in the database than to have the password itself. Even if somebody did violate our database and get a list of all these password digests, what are they going to do with them? Right? It should be impossible or at least computationally infeasible that they would be able to take this and turn it back into the original password, which means even though they have this digest, they still can't log in as that user. They still can't go to other websites and try and use the same password the user used on this website. Because, of course, if somebody were to take this value and were to put it in as a user's password, the password system would take this and digest that. Right? So it wouldn't end up being the same thing one way or the other. All right. So that's the basic idea with that. If I go back to my main list of users, I can see that new user is listed there. If I tell it I want to create another new user and I leave fields blank, they all get marked nicely. That's happening for me automatically, the scaffold generator. 
puts in the section that handles displaying the errors up at the top of the form. Right? It also created a CSS style sheet for us, which is why we're seeing some colors here. So that's lovely. Let me make another user here. Test2, password, password. There we go. Now I've got two users. Okay. So we've got gadget types, we've got gadgets, we've got users in this little application at the moment. We need to connect users and gadget type, uh, users and gadgets. A new user needs to be able to have gadgets. A user can have many gadgets, but each gadget should belong to exactly one user. Okay? To be able to set up that one-to-many relationship, okay, there would need to be a user ID field in the gadget table in the database where we could store the ID for the user that that gadget belongs to. Right now our gadget table does not have a user ID field so we need to add one. So back out on the terminal, back out at the command line, I'm going to say Rails generate migration. I'm going to call my migration add user ID to gadgets. What I want to add then is a field called user ID and I want it to be an integer. The generator should figure out that that field's being added to the gadgets table. We'll create my migration for me. If I do rake db migrate then it'll be applied to the database. It added a column to the gadgets table called user ID that's an integer. That's just what I wanted. Over in my user model then, I can form my association. I can say a user has many gadgets. I should probably also say dependent destroy. So if we delete a user from the system, all their gadgets get deleted as well. Over in the gadget model then, I'm going to say that not only does a gadget belong to gadget type, but a gadget also belongs to a user. Make sense? Okay. Let me go back over to the users index page. When I create my list of users, maybe I'll also list how many gadgets that user has. So I'll add a new table, a, a new cell to my table where the users are being displayed. After I display the username, I'll also put in user gadgets dot size number of gadgets I'll label that column both my users right now should have zero gadgets so if I take a look at that in the browser and it comes up as zero yeah, then that's what I would expect as a correct answer for the moment
Chin good? Do you have any questions? I think we got that basic part done. How are we on time? Doing well. All right, let's see. I think we're about ready for the actual authentication now that we have all the bits and pieces in place. I guess the big question is which direction to come to it. Do we want to start off by not allowing access to any pages unless we can authenticate, in which case we lock ourselves out of our own application until we write the code to get back in? Or do we start by writing the code to let ourselves get in and then lock it down at the last moment? Hmm. Maybe we'll do a little bit of both. Okay. At some point in here, what we're going to need is we're going to need a sessions controller. Right? That's where we're going to control the logging in and the logging out. Should I generate a scaffold for my new sessions controller? In this case, scaffold wouldn't do me any good. The scaffold is always going to create a model, a controller, a bunch of view files. And for my sessions controller, all I really need is the controller with a couple of methods in it, just a couple. And I need one view, which would be the login page. You don't need a view for the logout or anything like that. right? You can't edit your login. You don't need to be able to show your login or list logins for yourself. So most of the stuff that the scaffold generator would create for us in this case would be useless. So there's just really no point in even messing with it. We might as well just write it by hand. So let me just do that. Let me say uh, Rails G controller. I want to create a new controller. I'm going to call it Sessions. Sessions controller is how it should end up. There we go. If I go take a look at my controllers, there's my new sessions controller. And really what I want in here is I want a new method. <clears throat> my new method is essentially going to be the login page. I'm going to want a create method. The create method is where we actually create the new session, which is like a login essentially where we record the fact that somebody has logged in. I'm also going to want a destroy method. The destroy method deletes the session, which is essentially like logging out. So those are really the only three methods that I'm going to want in here. Only one of them is going to have a view, and that's the login page itself. And essentially what I'm trying to do, as much as possible, is to continue to stick with the idea of being RESTful. Even though logging in and logging out kind of seems like its own separate thing, if you twist it the right way and squint your eye and stick your tongue out of the side of your mouth, you can think of logging in and logging out as being like restful actions, right? Creating, destroying, stuff like that, which is why I decided to name these methods this. I don't have all seven of the basic restful actions, but I have three of them, which seems to be the only ones that I can think of that are appropriate for logging in and logging out. Okay? Does it matter that these are restful? Well, Maybe not at the moment, but it certainly could make a difference to me in the future. Okay. For the new page, for the new action, I want to create the actual login page itself. So under Views, Sessions, I want to create a new file there. I'm going to save it as new.html.erb.
and this will be my login page. Don't we have a partial for showing flash messages? Yeah, notice. There it is right there under our shared folder. Let me go ahead and call that from here. <clears throat> I'm going to say render shared notice. So if there's any uh, flash messages, I can have them shown. And then down here is where I'm going to want my form. but we don't really need to write the form yet. We'll come back and get it here in a minute. Okay. Can I access that page in my browser? If I go to sessions slash new, routing error. Since I created that new page kind of by hand, I didn't use the scaffold generator. I just barely even used the controller generator. No route has been created for me for that particular page. So I need to create that route by hand. So let me go over to my routes file. I have resources in there for users, gadget types, and gadgets. The one for users, that was created for me by the scaffold generator. I forgot to point that out to you before. Okay. What I want to do is I need to create my own route to get to that new page. Okay. You know, I don't know that I want to call it Sessions New, though. That might kind of make sense to me, but what most people would call that would just be the login form, right? So what if I made a route and I said match login with sessions new. In the browser, if I then go to slash login, that takes me straight to my login page. That's much nicer looking than Sessions New, and it would make more sense to most people, right? If somebody said, hey, how do I log into your site? And I said, go to slash Sessions slash New, they'd probably go, oh, what? Right? But if I say, just go to slash Login, yeah, everybody's going to understand that. Good. Okay. I'm kind of leaving some blanks in here as I go through. not filling in the form quite yet, not really worrying about how we're actually going to create or delete sessions, okay? But trying to kind of get the basic framework for everything laid out. I think the next thing I want to put in is the actual authentication itself. Okay? The code that actually says, is this user logged in? If yes, then fine, they can access the page. If no, then to the login page with you. That's the little bit I want, think I want to put in next. Okay. I need somewhere to put this code, somewhere to put this code that says, is the user logged in? Right? If so, let them be. If not, redirect them. Right? Overall, that code is going to have to be accessible from my controllers. right? Because essentially what I'm going to want to be able to do is in my gadgets controller, I'm going to want to be able to say, if they request the index page, are they logged in? No, to the login page with you. If they say, I want to create a new gadget, I have to be able to say, are they logged in? No, to the login page with you. So essentially I need to, in my gadgets controller, for every action in there, I need to be able to call I need to be able to check, maybe would be a better way of saying it, if the user is logged in or not. But it's not just in the gadgets controller's actions that I want to be able to do that. I also want to be able to do it under gadget types. They can't access any of the types. I want to be able to do it in the user's controller. I can't have just everybody in the world traipsing through the user's controller creating and editing users. 
right? Really, this is something that I need to be able to do in all these controllers. So the sensible place to put this code would be to put it into the application controller. Remember, the application controller is inherited from by all other controllers. So if I add my authentication code to the application controller, that means that it will then, through inheritance, be available to everyone, be available to all of my controllers. I can use it anywhere I want it. So this is the place to put this code. <clears throat> so let me add a new method to my application controller. I'll call it authenticate. And essentially what I want to do in here is I want to say unless we have a user, this current user, I just made that up. That's not a Rails method. We'll need to write that or figure that part out. Basically, I'm going to say unless there's a current user, redirect to login path. Now this login path, what's up with that? Well, over in my routes file, when I created this, when I called this match method to create my login route, it should have automatically created a method for me called login path, which I can call anytime I want to go to that page. We can, of course, go back out to the command line, run rake routes. Down there at the very bottom, I have a named route that takes me to the login page, which is sessions new. Okay, so I have a little authenticate method there. Whenever I call it, it says, unless we have a current user, send them to the login page. How do we know if we have a current user or not? Well, let's add a method called current user. Okay. Essentially, what I want to do is create a current user by going to the user class and finding whoever the current user is supposed to be. Well, who is the current user supposed to be? Well, the current user should be whoever's ID is in the session. So if I say inside the session in a key called user ID, then that's the current user. That'll only work, though, of course, if there is a user in the session, a user ID in the session. So I'm going to finish that up by saying if in the session there is a user ID. I might add one other little thing to this. Every time I do this user.find, assuming somebody's logged in, that's an access to the database. Okay. Well, if somebody needs, if I end up calling this current user method multiple times on the same page, I don't necessarily want to hit the database multiple times if I already have the current user. So I'm going to say or equals. Okay which essentially means if we already have a current user, just keep them. Don't worry about getting them again. Only if we don't already have a current user do we then hit the database if there is a user ID in the session. I think that'll handle the basic authentication. We have this authenticate method we can call 
in our controllers to trigger authentication, we start then by checking to see if we have a user. We know we have a user right, because in the session we would have their user ID stored. That's what we'll do when they log in. When they log out, that's what we'll destroy. So whenever we check to see if somebody is authenticated, we call current user, we hit the database, pull up their user record based on their ID if it exists. If it doesn't exist, this overall is going to end up returning nil, which is going to be considered false up here, which means they'll then get sent to the login page. If an actual user down here in current user is found, Right? The user will be considered true up here, right? and we don't redirect them to the login page. We let them just go on doing whatever it is they ask to do. Right? The way I could actually apply this then is over in the user's controller, for example, I could apply it using a filter. In the user's controller, I'll say before filter, authenticate. That means that it'll run my authenticate method before any other action. So if somebody says, I want to see the list of all users, the first thing that will happen is it will authenticate them and send them to the login page if they're not logged in. Okay. Up in gadget types. Before you can do anything in the gadget types, maybe you have to authenticate. Maybe what I'll do there is I'll let them see maybe the index and the show page of gadget types. So I'm going to say before filter authenticate except for index and show. I will have to go back and do something about the new and the edit and the destroy links that show up on those pages though. We can take care of that though. In my actual gadget controller I'll put in before filter authenticate. You can't do anything in the gadget controller unless you've authenticated. <clears throat> Let's see how it works. I'm not authenticated right now. If I go over to my browser and I try to go to the gadgets page, I ended up back over at the login page again. What happened? Well, I tried to go to gadgets index. Right? <clears throat> In the gadgets controller, the first thing it said to do was authenticate before it would give me back the index. Okay? So we ran the authenticate method. The authenticate method tried to pull up the current user. Okay? Nobody was down here. No ID was in the session because I'm not logged in. So nil was returned, so it redirected me to the login page. That should happen for pretty much anything I try to access. If I try to go to the users index, it sends me to the login page. If I try to go to gadget types new, sends me to the login page. If I just try to go to gadget types, that's one that I said for accept. So it lets me go there. Let's me go to the gadget types index. I can also click on a gadget type and it lets me go to the gadget type show. But if I try to destro destroy a gadget type, it sends me to the login page. If I try to edit a gadget type, sends me to the login page. So I think it's covered pretty well there. Okay. So 
so we've got all the background code we need, all the basic parts built to be able to do our authentication. We've got the actual authentication set in place as it is right now. We basically at this point just need to have the ability to be able to log in right, to get past the authentication. And we need the ability to then log back out again. Right? But this is probably a good place to stop for today. So we will finish off our sessions controller with the login and the logout code on uh, Tuesday. And once we do that, there's then going to be a sweep of other changes we're going to need to make through here. Because right now, when you log in and you go to the gadgets index, you're going to see all of the gadgets. We'll need to change that sort of thing so a user only sees the gadgets that belong to them themselves. Right? I'm thinking we're also probably going to have to do something about authorization. Right now, we're just doing straight authentication. If you can log in, you can access anything. If you can't log in, you basically can't access anything. But that doesn't really make sense, does it? Any user can log in and then access all other users, delete other user accounts. Yeah, it's not a bright way to go, I don't think. So we're probably going to need to go back and maybe incorporate in the concept of a regular user versus an administrator, something like that. That's what we'll work on. Is it making sense? <clears throat> All right. Well, great. I hope you uh, both have a great weekend. I'll see you on Tuesday. Keep your fingers crossed this video comes out.